morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. It is pretty chilly today, I must say. Um, we are in a series at the moment on the book of Judges, and it's, it's essentially tragic tales of broken people being used by God to deliver his people. And so far we've looked at, if you've been part of the series, uh, we've looked at Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, beautiful names. And last week Charlotte preached on Gideon. And just a reminder that if you miss a Sunday and you want to catch up, you can listen to the podcast or you can watch it on YouTube, but I encourage you to go over it again. Charlotte's message last week was absolutely excellent. Um, so listen to the podcast. It's, it's amazing how as we go through the Bible, we can go through the Old Testament and we can think to ourselves, how on earth could they have done that? Like you think about Adam and Eve, you think just, just avoid that tree. You know, we, we go through the Old Testament and we think there's so many things that I look at them doing and think, if I was in that situation, I would never do that. Uh, I would never kind of behave the way they did when they shouldn't have done the things that they did. And then if we look at our lives and we look at the Old Testament, we see that they kind of run in very parallel lines. You know, we think I would never do that. And then when we look at our lives today, we think, Oh, wait, maybe it's not so different for me. The Old Testament is full of physical examples of spiritual principles that we can learn from. And I trust that as we go through this series, the Holy Spirit will speak to us and say, there's a repetitive pattern or there's a cycle that I want to break you out of in your life. And I'm going to show you what it is so that you can move forward. So we don't go around and around and around the same mountains again and again. One thing we've looked at as we've gone through the book of Judges is they have this repetitive cycle. They distance themselves from God. And how many people do that? Life happens. Life gets busy. Things happen. So we distance ourselves from God. Then they camped close to compromise. You know, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak until the spirit's stripping and the flesh is uh, absolutely dominating. I realize this thing's going up and down. Is it me? Is it, is it, is it coming through to the same? Okay, there we go, from the very back, thumbs up. Um, so, what happens is people, they distance themselves from God, then they camp close to compromise, then they abandon God and find themselves in deep, deep trouble. So what they do is they cry out to God, Lord, please help us, please deliver us. So God raises up a judge, and then he delivers the people, and they go around the mountain again and again and again and again. And how often do we do the same thing? We go around the same mountain again and again, distancing ourselves from God, getting ourselves into trouble, crying out to God, and then he has to rescue us. And there are certain signs that we can learn from the Israelites of things they did that caused them to go around the same mountain, or, or just before they went around the same mountain, there's certain things that we can pick up on. And one of the big signs of Israel's spiritual decline, and something that we can all look at in our own lives, is something preceded their detour. And the thing is a lack of gratitude. When we notice in our own lives that we are starting to lack gratitude, it could be one of the first signs of spiritual decay. Um, they had peace for 45 years, thanks to the previous judges. And in that space of comfort, everything was going okay. They became complacent and allowed idolatry to creep back into their culture. Listen to this. The essence of idolatry is enjoying the gifts while neglecting the giver. Enjoying the gifts while neglecting the giver. We are all so blessed. And what happens is life happens. Things happen. Life gets busy. So we distance ourselves from God. And all of a sudden we become so obsessed about the gifts, but we neglect the giver of the gifts. That's one of the first signs of a spiritually decaying, decaying life. Uh, talking about gifts. I need some water. There we go. Oh, that's very delicious. Thank you, Lord. Um, I, I think it's always awkward drinking in front of people because they're waiting for you to finish drinking. So I feel like every time I stand still. Um, idolatry is often a good thing that we turn into a God thing. And I've shared that before. It's a good thing that we turn into a God thing. And it's hard to be grateful when we serve 
a master that can never be satisfied. And idolatry is when we make the gifts above the giver and they constantly demand from our lives and they take, 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 but they are never satisfied. And then we lose our gratitude and we distance ourselves from God. And the Israelites did this. They distanced themselves from God and they lost their gratitude. And once again, they ended up being suppressed, oppressed, depressed, probably some possessed while God was unimpressed. And they were getting crushed on every side until they cried out to God again. And like so many of us do, Lord Jesus, please come into my situation and rescue me. And God raises up another judge. So today is the, we're looking at our fifth judge and his name is Jephthah. Now, that's the way I'm going to say it. That's the way I think it's supposed to be said. But I'm sure somebody will be like, actually, Tim, it's Jephthah. But whatever. We'll call him Jephthah. Judges 11, verse 1 to 3. Listen, now, now, let God speak to you as we go through this message. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. It's a good, a good start. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. So today's story is just another classic underdog story with a tragic ending, yet lots that we can learn from the scripture, so nothing is for nothing. Jephthah, just like all the other judges, just like many of us, comes from a very dysfunctional home. His background is absolutely broken. And because the Israelites had neglected God and they had camped close to compromise, they ended up embracing the cultures of the world around them, right? And we've got to be careful of that. So this is what happened, is the people, Jephthah's family, embraced the culture of the world around them. In those days, the Canaanites They used to worship the God called Baal, and they believed in human sacrifices, and they would go to the temple, and they were temple prostitutes. So it's likely that Jephthah's dad was probably with one of the temple prostitutes. So his father was with a prostitute, yet he was kind enough to keep his son. Instead of just discarding his son, he kept him, right? So all he was to his his stepmother and his siblings was a reminder of their father's compromise. So can you imagine growing up in that environment when all you are is just a reminder of somebody's compromise? So as soon as his father died, or at least before he could get an inheritance, his family kick him out, and they say, go somewhere else. And can you imagine all the rejection issues that this guy is going through? So Jephthah grew up fending for himself, and in the process, he became as tough as nails. He was a mighty warrior. So they kicked him out, and like attracts like, so he became the boss of a bunch of scoundrels. So there he was with these rough guys. So he's like essentially a bluff local, right? So <laughs> any, 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 I'm just joking. For all the bluff visitors in the room, <laughs> um, he wasn't that rough. Um, okay, so <laughs> yo, if you're watching this online from the bluff, just joke, joking. There's a song by, by Johnny Cash. Have you heard it? It's called A Boy Named Sue. Anyone heard that song? It's about a dad who names his son Sue because he knows he's not going to be there with him. So he'll get bullied at school. So he'll grow up tough. Right? So <laughs> this guy's like that. Um, something that all of us have in common is that we didn't get to pick our parents. I don't know about you. <laughs> I did not choose my parents. And it's not Jephthah's fault. Jephthah's fault who his parents were. So they kicked him out, yet this guy's been watching bully be done, he's tough, he's a fighter, he's a mighty warrior according to scripture, and when trouble comes knocking on the Israelites' door, who are you going to call? Right? How many of you are thinking Ghostbusters? (laughs) We are shaped by culture, am I right? The answer is after. So we, we need to we need to recognize that we can't be shaped by culture. We can't, you know, you can stay as you are for the rest of your life. Or you can <laughs> shaped by culture, or we can turn to Jesus. The Israelites were being shaped by culture, and that allowed compromise to get close to them. And then t- things get tough, and all of a sudden they go, Who are we gonna call? Jephthah. 
right? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not setting you up there. And Jephthah responds, responds, they approach him the same way that many of us approach God. This is, this is God's heart is expressed through Jephthah's response to the people. Judges 11, 4 to 7. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. So they go find him. We need a fighting man. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me away from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? How often do we do exactly the same thing to God? You know, the, the, the people approach Jephthah the same way that they approach God. Things are good, so keep your distance. We, you know, we know where you are. We'll call you when, you need you when we need you. But in the meantime, stay away. And all of a sudden, thing get, things get really difficult. And they're like, hey, Jephthah, how are you, buddy? <laughs> how are the scoundrels? What are you guys up to? You know, and they, all of a sudden, they want to call on the guy that they've rejected. So he questions their integrity. Judges 11, verse 9, Judges 11, 9 to 11. Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Interestingly, Jephthah, out of all of the judges, calls on God more than all of them. Now the Israelites had been living in peace for hundreds of years. Then the Ammonite king, all of a sudden, he's like, hey, that land was, that was our land first, so we want that land back. So Jephthah says, you know, we, we wanted peace. We tried to enter into this promised land without causing any trouble, and we asked for permission to settle somewhere. And what happens is the Ammonites said, no, 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 we don't want you to settle here, so they attacked them. So what they did was they defended themselves and they got the land that God had promised them. And then for hundreds of years, there was peace. And all of a sudden, the Ammonite king was like, I think it was over 300 years. He says, we want that land back. So Jephthah says, look, let's, not, let's try and settle this thing peacefully. We don't need bloodshed. We don't need war. Um, leave us alone. But the Ammonite king was land greedy and he wanted it. So he says, so Jephthah says, guys, let's get ready for war. And scripture tells us, that the Spirit of God was on Jephthah. He had the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God rests on you today. He had the Spirit of God. So he's as tough as nails, and now he has the blessing. A bluff boy with a blessing, right? So he's tough, and he's got God's favor. Then Jephthah does the craziest thing. Remember, God was already with him. Have you ever made a vow or a promise to God? Lord, if you come through for me, if you do this, then, then I'll do that. If you come through for me, then I'll stop doing all the bad things and I'll only do the good things every day for the rest of my life. Lord, please come through for me. Jephthah makes a vow, yet so rooted in this culture of compromise that his parents had embraced. And this is what he says. Remember, God's already with him. Judges 11, 30 to 31. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. He's trying to earn favor for a battle that the Lord has already gone ahead and won. God has already paid for it. For us living on this side, you know, when we're living in New Testament times, remember the message, Tetelestai, it is finished. What Jesus did on the cross, paid in full. So we try and negotiate with God to get the blessing that he already wants to give us. Right? He's making a rash vow to achieve what the Lord has already made available. So he says, Lord, give me the victory over the Ammonites, and I will sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house when I return from battle. Maybe he's thinking, you know, that cat has clawed my couch for the last time. Um, or, uh, you know, I have too many goats in the house. Let's get rid of one. He goes to war. God who's with him gives him the victory that God would have given him because God was with him. And then he returns home. Judges 11, 34 and 35. Drinking water for dramatic pausing effect. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, 
who should come out to meet him but his daughter? When you've got a daughter, she's dancing to the sound of tambourines. She was an only child except for, for her, yet neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried. Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. So he gets home and he sees his daughter and she's absolutely ecstatic to see him. She's like, dad's home. She's so happy. She's playing tambourine. She's dancing. She's celebrating. My dad is okay. All right. God had already made it clear that he was absolutely against human sacrifice. So he tells her, I've made a promise to God. And her response is absolutely mind-blowing. What would you say? (laughs) Your dad comes home and he's like, I promised God I would sacrifice you. Judges 11, 36 to 40. My father, she replied, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he vowed. And she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young men of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. What a terrible, terrible end to the story. And what makes it worse is it should never have happened. Jephthah makes this promise out of passionate ignorance fused with a culture of compromise. Devoted to his religious practice, yet at some point relationally disconnected from the heart of God. He's so devoted to God, yet doesn't understand the God that he is devoted to. It's possible to devote ourselves to God out of, um, sorry, the God of our perceptions, yet not the God of the Bible. This is so important. We can end up devoting ourselves to the God of our perceptions but not the God of the Bible. So we live according as slaves to who we think God wants us to be and do what God we think God wants us to do, yet that's not the God that Scripture represents. We just call it the same name. Right? Thank God we have the Scriptures. Thank God for Jesus, who gives us a revelation of the heart of God. So we get to know Jesus by having an understanding of Scripture and living in that revelation. Otherwise, we get pulled into detours that are not the heart of God, and we think it's great because we're representing Him in the process. So what is the point of the story? When Dad gets home from work, (laughs) don't be the first one to run out to. (laughs) No, no, that's not the... And don't go camping with your wife (laughs) if if you missed last week or the week before. Um, I just got a few points. Number one. Our past doesn't dictate our future. Jephthah was the son of a prostitute, rejected by his family, cut off from his inheritance, and only called on when they really needed something. Some of you have the dodgiest pasts. You have broken histories. Your family is dysfunctional and broken, but our past is not our future. So right now, we could have mighty men and women sitting in the group that go, I'm just." because of my past and God saying actually your past does not determine your future I do Romans 8 verse 28 which has come up a lot recently but it's something we need to take to heart and we know that for those who love God um, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose God will take our messy past our mistakes our setback and use them only when we put him on the throne of our lives not when we are idolatrous and mold God to fit our perspective right? Essentially, is an, is, uh, when we take God and we try and create him to be something that suits our lifestyle, it's called idolatry. And God is not for idolatry. 
So if our past is not what we want it to be, leave it there and make focusing on Jesus your life's goal. So number one, recap. Our past is behind us. Leave it there. Today, there's everybody in the room. You are either saved or not. If you are not saved, you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Today is that day. If you are saved, then you are an ambassador of the living God, Jesus Christ. Your life's goal is to reflect and represent the king, to take ground for the king and the kingdom, to live for Jesus. Your past is behind you. Jesus is your future. He's the reason you live. You are an ambassador. Number two, point number two, ignorance isn't bliss. You know, we say, ah, ignorance is bliss. Jeff knew God, but then his understanding of God was distorted by external influences of his. And we have so many voices trying to tell us who God is through all this different social media stuff. And it's shaping this perspective of God that's not the God of the Bible. And people are getting shaped by social media instead of the scriptures. Deuteronomy uh, 18 verse 10 to 11. This was the message that Jephthah would have understood as an Israelite. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or one who is a medium or spiritist or consults the dead. God puts boundaries in place to protect us. And if we don't know what those boundaries are, we don't know the rules, so to speak, it doesn't mean that we are free of the consequence of those rules. So if you go to a particular land or you're playing a particular game and you don't know what the rules are and you break the rules, you still got to deal with the consequence. Even though you might be forgiven and God understands that, we still got the consequences of obstructing the rules when we break them. So Jesus says... um, you know, we say, oh, Lord, but, but Lord, you tell me to do this and you tell me to live like that, but I, I'd rather not do those things because they're uncomfortable. So I will try and mold you to fit my lifestyle and therefore ignorance is bliss. So I'll carry on. But ignorance doesn't remove consequences. So if we are living our lives today and we think things like, well, the Bible's pretty old fashioned, so it's not really relevant. And I'm just going to shape it to what I believe. Then we have created an idol that doesn't reflect Jesus Christ. And that idol will make us a slave And then we end up sacrificing and giving up things that will absolutely rob our lives. But it's not the God of the Bible. Jephthah's ignorance cost him dearly. What does our ignorance cost us? Do we take cultural norms and try and merge them with biblical values? And I I had an example, and I left my example out because I realized that people feel like I'm throwing stones. But we cannot say today's culture does this and it's okay because it's the way it is in culture because we've left, let things creep into our culture that we think are absolutely fine, but they're not fine. And if you are living in a certain way and you know that you are compromising to culture, I encourage you to seek God and get those things in order. Get your house in order. Hosea 4 verse 6 says, My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. In in some versions it says, for a lack of knowledge. Since you priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priests. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not being slow in doing what he promised, the way some people understand slowness. But God is being patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants everyone to change their way and stop sinning. Ignorance isn't an an excuse. And if God's not doing anything and you're not doing consequences, you can think, well, it's fine then. I just continue to do that. But the truth is God is being very kind and very gracious. And he's giving us space to repent. And remember this, the kindness of God leads to repentance, not the judgment of other Christians. Yo. Point number two, ignorance isn't bliss. May God open our eyes to the truth of his word so we can live in it and appropriate it as opposed to living our way and thinking God's okay with it because we've made God someone he's not. Sure, it's very intense in here. (laughs) Was it me? Something I said. (laughs) Um, Number three, obedience trumps sacrifice. Uh, In the passage that we're looking at, 
And Jephthah makes a huge sacrifice to receive the blessing that God has already made possible. 1 Samuel 15 verse 22. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Obedience, and I've said it many times, and I've heard it many times, and I have to say it again and again. Obedience is the love language of God. If you love me, you will obey me. Oh, but Lord, I give up this for you, and I give up that for you, and I made all these sacrifices. And and God's like, that's wonderful. Well done for giving up all those things and making all those sacrifices, but now obey me. (laughs) Um, So often we think, Lord... um, I'll cut this out of my life and I'll cut that out of my life. And therefore, because I've done the right things and I've gone to church and I've read my Bible and therefore somehow we've built up credit with God and and now he somehow owes us. Or that somehow appeases the conscience, our conscience, um, and we're doing the right thing, but going through the religious motions without the relational connection. But Lord, I give up my Sundays and I could have watched TV and there's, you know, sports on and it's a nice beach day and I gave up those things. And God's saying, that's wonderful. I love the sacrifice, but your obedience trumps your sacrifice. Do what I say. Listen to this. A woman said to Tim Keller, uh, who recently passed away, an amazing theologian, great teacher, uh, when realizing the gospel for the first time. I know why I want my morality to save me. If I'm saved by my good works, then like a taxpayer, I have rights. I've paid into the system and God owes me a good and decent life. And there is a limit to what the Father can ask of me. But if I'm saved by sheer grace, then my life belongs entirely to the Father. He owes me nothing. And there is no limit to what he can ask me. There is no sacrifice that we can bring that trumps the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Um, why, Why do we do what we do? Why do we come to church? Why do we read our Bible? Because we have to or because we get to? We want to walk in obedience, not thinking that somehow I'm going to keep making things good with God by going through religious practice. Actually, no, this is just an overflow of my love for the king and the kingdom. The battle belongs to the Lord, and I belong to the Lord of the battle. Yet when we do it our way, then we have to fight our own fight. When we do it God's way, the battle is already won. Then God's blessings are already on it. There is... Um, it's not our sacrifice that makes things right. It's his. I know it got quite intensely quiet in the room. I want us to be a people that don't make these radical life decisions that are completely entrenched with the culture of the land that don't represent the king and the kingdom because we're doing it for the king and the kingdom. But it's not Jesus of the Bible. It's a Jesus we've made to suit our minds. I want us to walk in radical obedience to Jesus, the Jesus of the Jesus, the Jesus that gives us eternal life, the Jesus that came to save us from our sins. Our past is not our future. Whatever you've done, no matter how messed up your past is, God has grace for an amazing future and God can use you. We are called to know God and he calls us to a life of obedience. I want to pray, but I, I, I just, just want to. You bow your heads with me, and I just, just let's just be quiet for a minute. pray, Lord, that all of us will have a sensitivity to your voice. Lord, we won't feel like we've somehow earned favor by doing religious things. But we recognize, Lord, that thank you to Jesus on the cross. The blessing is already ours. We have access to your presence. Tetelestai, it is finished. I pray, Lord, that you'll give us all a revelation of what grace is, your enabling power to overcome.
I thank you, Lord Jesus, that if there's things in our lives that you're calling us to let go of or to move from, or to give up or surrender or confess, give us the boldness, give us the grace, give us the wisdom to handle that with, with, in a way that honors you, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we won't depend on somebody else to have a right relationship with you, but we will all take personal responsibility of being right with you. And I thank you that we can learn from Jephthah's life, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us, even out of, even from broken people. Mm-hmm.